It's again a great pleasure pleasure for me today to be hosting uh, Kids First Investigators talking about the collaborative research and how they are using uh, data across multiple conditions uh, to foster uh, new discoveries. And it's a pleasure to call uh, Dr. Sobreda uh, to the podium. So I asked Anara to share uh, how uh, she would hope to impact the audience today. And uh, so she wants to bring, uh, highlight the importance of genomic research uh, and also multi, uh, walking through multidisciplinary uh, teams. So Nara, I will tell you, I will let you tell your story and uh, thank you again uh, for participating here today. Thank you, Marcia, for having me today. So let me share my screen with you all. So I hope you can see my screen now. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about our work um, studying uh, enchondromatosis. We have done whole genome sequencing to understand better these diseases, and I will tell you a little bit about our results so far. So enchondromatosis is a group of diseases characterized by Enchondromas that are benign cartilage tumors. So the patients have multiple cartilage tumors. And there are a few different diseases where that happened. And some of them I listed here. Um, they are mostly very rare. And for some of them, we know the gene and the gene uh, are mutated as a germline and they follow a Mendelian mode of inheritance. Like the, this is chondromatosis, that's autosomal dominant disease called by, caused by mutations in col 2 a one and the spondyloenchondrodysplasia if immune dysregulation, autosomal recessive caused by mutations in ACP5, and metachondromatosis, that's actually how I got involved with disease, these diseases when I identified that autosomal, that was autosomal dominant disease caused by loss of function mutations in PTPN11 during my PhD back in 2010. There are some others that we don't really know the cause, the, the, gen, the genetic etiology, like the metaphysial enchondromatosis with d 2 hydroxylutaric aciduria and the genochondromatosis. But the two most common ones, they are Olia disease and Mafuchi syndrome. So Olia disease, the patients have mainly the enchondromas, in Mafuchi syndrome, the patients have the enchondromas plus vascular anomalies, vascular anomalies type overgrowth, like what we see with the pic 3 ca um, diseases, for example. In both of these diseases, and they are the most common of the enchondromatosis, and in both of them, we do see a prevalence of 30% of these patients having chondrosarcomas. So there is a transformation of the enchondromas to chondrosarcomas in 30% of these patients. Most, some of these patients have the enchondromas and or the vascular anomalies as soon as they are born. And the chondrosarcomas, they appear later, a little bit later in life. And these enchondromas, independent of the chondrosarcomas and the vascular anomalies, they are very, very harmful to the patients. They can cause severe deformities with leg length discrepancy, arm length discrepancies, and this, this um, overgrowth that you see of the vascular anomalies, they can even cause amputation of fingers, toes, hands, feet, and even legs and arms. So it is a very uh, debilitating disease that affects uh, the, the patients from childhood. And then later, they will go on, many of them, to have malignancies like chondrosarcoma that I just said, but also few others. So 30% of the patients go on to have chondrosarcomas, but up to 50% of the patients go on to have a malignancy of some kind. Most of the malignancies that are affecting these patients after chondrosarcoma, they are the brain, the gliomas. So up to 10 to 15% of the patients with all the disease go on to have gliomas. And a little less, of the patients with Mafuchi also go on to have gliomas, like 5% of them, uh, between 3.8 and 5%. Uh, 
a few other patients also have other kind of malignancies, like they affect the ovaries in some of these patients, up to 5% in both polio disease and Mafuchi syndrome. And in Mafuchi syndrome, many of them, about 5% of them, end up having malignancies of the vascular overgrowth. So in general, in both cases, up to 50% of the patients end up with a malignancy of some kind during their life. So this is a disease that puts together the congenital anomalies. Many of these patients are already born with the deformities, the skeletal deformities caused by the enchondromas or the vascular anomalies and cancer that can happen during the childhood, but it's actually more common a little later in life. So these diseases are mostly isolated. There is no case that is known of Ollie disease and Mafuchi syndrome that is actually familial. As far as we know, all the cases that have been described and all the cases that we have actually enrolled in this project are isolated cases in the family. And there is, uh, when I started investigating this disease in, back in 2010, nobody knew anything about them. Like there was no gene whatsoever that was associated with them. But then in 2011, two different groups identified in 80% of the patients mutations in IDH1 or IDH2 in the samples from enchondromas, chondrosarcoma, or vascular anomalies of these patients. These are the gain of function variants in IDH1 and IDH2 that we see in the patients with many other cancers, mainly like gliomas and leukemias. And if you are um, familiar with these mutations and in these other cancers, you know that usually in gliomas and leukemias, IDH1 and IDH2, they do co-occur with all the variants in all the genes. So when we found out that these variants were present from these other two groups in, in the patients with early disease in Mafuchi syndrome, our first question was, what's the role of these genes in these patients? And are they the only gene in these patients that are causing the patients to have the enchondromas? But how also could some of the patients go on to have the chondrosarcomas and the other malignancies and some do not, while 80% of them have the IDH on IDH2 independent of having malignancies or not. So we, we decided that we wanted to investigate better and investigate not only the tumor of the patients and not only IDH1 and IDH2 mutations specifically, but do an investigation that was genome-wide, germline, and tumor of these patients to understand better what was going on in the mutational landscape, and with that, maybe get to a pharmacological treatment that would avoid these tumors to develop from the beginning. So our ultimate goal is actually to try to find a medication that would stop the enchondromas to grow as soon as the first ones appear, or even make the ones that are already there to decrease in size and avoid all the skeletal deforms that these patients develop that are really very debilitating for them. So our hypothesis is that um, th these syndromes are cancer predisposition syndromes and that they are caused by germline variants or early posygotic variants that in combination with mutations that appear later will cause not only the enchondroma progression, but also the transformation of these enchondromas and chondrosarcomas and the peers of other malignancies. So we are actually looking for multiple genes in each of these patients that would act together to cause the disease the way it is appearing in the patients. So to do that, we decided we needed to sequence a large number of patients. And the kids first, project was a perfect opportunity when I had just started as a faculty at Hopkins to actually do that. But at that point, we didn't have all the patients that we needed. And we actually, after we got the grant, we went on to find these patients. So here it was the first time as a faculty that I really had to collaborate, but not only with all the physicians, right? I started by reaching out to 
surgeons, to dermatologists, to everybody who would maybe be seeing patients with these disorders to find out who could send us samples for the project. But turns out these are rare diseases. So there's no one person that sees dozens of these patients in a year. And the best collaboration that I actually set up was with the patients themselves. When I realized that it would be very difficult to me to find uh, all the physicians that together we could put the samples all together for the project, I decided to reach out directly to the patients. And that was one of the best collaborations that I did during my, the beginning of my career and has been on up to now, thankfully, was with the patients themselves. So I wrote a protocol, uh, I submitted to our, our IRB at Hawkins and I was allowed to reach out to these patients directly through the media, through the media platforms. And they are the ones that actually made this project happen. So they really collaborated with us on connecting to each other and informing each other of the project and getting patients to reach out to us directly to show their interest and participate with us on the project. So as of today, we have actually sequenced about 130 patients, but I'm going to show you the data of 94 that we have analyzed so far. So we performed whole exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing on 94 patients. We analyzed all 94 patients today and 71 of them have earlier disease and 23 of them have Mapuche syndrome. And of these 94, we have samples from 68 trios. And these patients were sequenced through the kids first, but also through the Baylor Hopkins Center for Mendelian Genomics. So the genomes were done through the kids first and the exomes were done through Baylor Hopkins. And the exons that are done through the Bill Hopkins are mostly the ones that we didn't have trios because the, the Kids First project was intended for the trios specifically. So what have we found with our initial analysis? We identified variants that are rare with minor allele frequency lower than 1% encoding in six genes, HIF1 alpha, VHL, IDH1, IDH2, KDM4C, and CDKN2A in about 22% of our patients. So it's like 21 out of the 94 and 14 of them have early disease and seven of them have Mafuchi syndrome. So what is, what does, why is it important? Why these genes specifically? Well, what we noticed when we were doing the analysis and we are finding the mutations repeating on these genes is that these genes actually, they all belong to the HIF1 alpha pathway. And that was striking to us and made us focus a little bit more on this pathway in these patients. So the one question that we had to begin with before we could really get into functional, day, functional studies for these genes was, is it just by chance? Right, that we are finding these variants in these genes among our patients. And these are germline variants. So we are focusing here today on the analysis that we are doing on the germline um, sequencing. And we performed this board analysis. We had, um, let me just, oh, yeah. So we had about 2,100 uh, samples that we used as controls. And then we had the 94 samples that were the group of patients. And we compared to look in, the bo in both groups, what were the number of variants that were rare coding, not including the synonyms among the patients compared to the controls to see if the rate of variance among the patients in these genes was higher than among the controls. And we identified that the variance in HIF1 alpha in VHL and in IDH1, the germline variants were actually more common among the patients than in controls with a, a, a difference that was statistically significant. And you can see here the, P, the corrected p-value of this, this, this comparison. So that made us really um, be more excited about the pathway, about the variants, about the genes, 
and wanted to understand more how this pathway is affected in these patients and how actually does it interact, like how does it relate with what we already know, knew about the IDH1 and IDH2 mutations in these patients. So this is just an overview of the HIF1 alpha pathway. You can see here on normoxia, we have usually degradation of HIF1 alpha um, by, contact, by, by a complex that is formed together with VHL. And if we have hypoxia, this complex doesn't form, HIF1 alpha is not degraded and goes on to activate many pathways downstream. So you have here the pathways like angiogenesis, erythropoiesis, metabolism, cell survival. These are all pathways that are downstream HIF1 alpha that are activated at hypoxia when HIF1 alpha is upregulated. Up so, and in this, here you can see that we found mutations in HIF1 alpha itself. It's actually the first time that mutations in HIF1 alpha have been identified in patients and related to a disease. It has never been described before mutations in HIF1 alpha itself. Then we have mutations in VHL that we all know cause VHL syndrome. The, our patients do not have any features of VHL syndrome. They do have vascular anomalies and some of the patients with VHL syndrome have vascular anomalies, but it's a slightly different kind of vascular anomalies. They are not exactly what we see in the Mafuchi syndrome. And also the malignancies in the VHL syndrome are different of the malignancies that we have seen in the patients with Mafuchi or earlier disease. But our patients have mutation in VHL. And you see here, we have actually six patients with mutation in VHL, seven patients with mutation in HIF1 alpha, and three patients that had germline mutations in IDH1. One of them was a gain of function mutation that we already know, the one that we already know, the R132. But the other two were not the gain of function that are well known and described in the cancer. So here we also have mutation in CDK and 2A. That's another inhibitor of the complex formation that has to happen during the hypoxia. So HIF1 alpha is actually activated. And we have KDM4C that is also a co-activator of HIF1 alpha during hypoxia. So we have these genes here, HIF1 alpha, VHL, CDKN2A, and KDM4C with mutations. We do have also two patients that have EGLN1 mutations, but because the number of patients was too low, we are still get, gathering more evidence to actually before we actually go on and study more EGLN2, EGL, EGLN1, sorry. We didn't find mutations in EGLN2 or EGLN3 that are all here acting in that step of uh, the pathway during normoxin. So how this pathway actually correlates with IDH1 and IDH2 that we already knew are mutated in patients with early disease and Mafuchi syndrome. The mutations in IDH1 and IDH2, they are gain of function because they actually create a new function for IDH1 and IDH2. What happens now is that this alpha ketoglutarate, that's the product that would be created by the normal regular IDH1 and IDH2 is not created anymore. What is formed now is D2-hydroxylutaric acid, acid, sorry. And these D2-hydroxylutaric acids are oncometabolite and it actually acts by inhibiting some of the functions of these, inhibiting KDM4C and upregulating EGLNs. And the upregulation of EGLN would actually cause downregulation of HIF1 alpha. So, this is how the HIF1 alpha pathway is connected to IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. So, we really got very interested on that because we are finding more mutations on these genes that are in the HIF1 alpha pathway that is a pathway that is connected, directly connected with IDH1 and IDH2. So as I told you, these patients also have cancers like gliomas and IDH1 and IDH2 are also very well studied in the setting of isolated gliomas. And also in the chondrosarcomas, 50% of the patients in isolated chondrosarcomas have the same gain of function mutations in IDH1 and IDH2. So now that we were finding the mutations in the HIF1 alpha pathway in our patients, 
our next question was, what about patients with, ideate, with isolated gliomas and isolated chondrosarcomas? What about this pathway in these patients? Are these genes mutated in these patients also? So that is actually the title of this lecture is actually the title of our R03. So we submitted the R03 that um, Mas has mentioned a few times today. And we wanted to do the analysis of this data, but actually gathering the samples, the information on samples from gliomas and chondrosarcomas to study the genes that we find in the patients with Olin Mafuchi, independent of HIF1 alpha or not in these cohorts, but also do the anal one analysis that's focusing on the HIF1 alpha pathway. So that we, that is, started us on the path of trying to track down where to find the data and how to have access to the data. And I have to say, uh, the speaker Joaquin just before me just talked about the nightmare that is to know where all the data is. It is very complicated to find where all the data is. Like, where can I find sequencing from patients with glioma? Where can I find sequencing from patients with chondrosarcoma or other tumors that are related like osteosarcoma, for example. So it's very easy to go to the kids first database and find what is there, but it's not easy to know what else is out there in all the databases. So that would be a very good thing. It would be to kind of centralize or, or at least have a place where we go and list all the places where these diseases may be, the samples related to these diseases may be, because we end up having to go everywhere to try to find it and not always we find. Uh, I'm sure sometimes we miss because we don't know, we didn't look at the one or other place that could be. So we actually found that in the Kids First website, we found that there were 816 patients uh, from the pediatric brain, brain tumor atlas that had been sequenced and these patients had gliomas and that we could access the data through the, the Cavarica and through the Kids First program, DRC and Cavarica, and we did that. Then we started looking for samples that are related to chondrosarcoma or sarcoma, osteosarcomas, and there are uh, 30, 383 patients that are part of an osseous and chondromatous neoplasm from the target OS project. That one, I still didn't figure out how to access the data. So I'm actually working uh, with some colleagues from NIH and CI to try to figure out how to find the data. And this is one of the data that we are trying to figure out how to access. But also through the kids first, I found that um, there are some osteosarcoma projects and Elwin sarcoma projects that are already access, are available to be accessed and I'm working on accessing them. And I just go through dbGaP access to whole genome sequence of 13 patients with osteosarcoma from the osteosarcoma genomics project. So first of all, these are not samples that are highly sequenced. Many samples are sequenced, like few samples of patients with these diseases are sequenced and they are a little bit everywhere. So it's a little hard to figure out where to go to find all of them. Doesn't look like you are going to go to one place and get all the samples. You really have to go to multiple places to try to get as many samples as possible. But we are working on that. We already have the glioma samples. We already have some osteosarcoma samples. And now we are trying to get the chondrosarcoma samples and the osteosarcoma and the Elwin sarcoma samples. Here is the sample that the samples that we got from the patients with gliomas from the pediatric brain tumor atlas database through the kids for scavarica. And we got this the VCF files uh, from these um, about 800 something patients, and we already harmonized the files. They are all harmonized through the Cavarica pipeline to the same way our samples are harmonized in Cavarica for the Olin Mafuchi project. And now we can start the comparison. So our comparison will first be patients versus controls, our patients with Olin Mafuchi versus controls, and 
patients with gliomas versus control. So we are working on that. And another, another step that we had to overcome was to find the samples that we would use as controls. And we figured that out. Some of the samples are going to be used as the samples that we sequenced through the Baylor Hopkins project. And some of the samples that we are going to use as controls are the samples that we sequenced as part of the kids first, because I actually collaborate with two other projects that were sequenced through the kids first, the bladder extrophy and the face syndrome. And we are going to use each other's data as controls to do this bird analysis to find out what of the 20,000 genes are more mutated among the patients compared to the control. We are starting with the germline analysis, but we are also going to do the two more analysis for the samples that we have that were sequenced as part of two more projects. So I think that's where we are right now. And with that, I wanted to, of course, uh, thank everybody who has been working with us on this project, different um, PIs in different labs, in different um, hospitals, the patients, and also the NIH and CPI team that has helped us a lot with finding the samples, um, uh, getting access to the samples, and with the whole understanding the process of how to access everything through Kavarika.